Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It is Tuesday, January 21st, 2014. If this episode of the Tom Woods Show does not blow your mind, then I give up, I resign, it's all over. Because we're joined today by the great Scott Horton. I'm going to bring on Scott in just a minute. Just remember that this month, you're running out of days in January 2014. This month only, I am giving away free signed copies of my New York Times bestselling book from 2004, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. you got to just join my libertyclassroom.com website where you can get the history and economics you were not taught in school but should have been in courses you can listen to in your car, and they're taught by me and by people I trust. So head over to libertyclassroom.com, join up, and then drop me a note on the contact page saying, hey, where's my book? Here's my address. All right, right now we're talking to Scott Horton. Scott is the host of The Scott Horton Show at libertyexpressradio.com every weekday, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern. He is also the host of Anti-War Radio on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles. You can follow Scott at scotthorton.org. And it's my pleasure right now, having been a guest on Scott's program so many times, to welcome Scott Horton to my own program. Scott, thanks for being here. Thank you, Tom. Good to talk to you again. All right, there's so many things we could talk about. It's basically insane to think about it, because I consider you sort of the go-to guy on pretty much any U.S. government conflict, large or small, over the past 15 to 20 years. So there's so much to talk about. We don't have to talk about what's going on this very week, although I am interested in that stuff. So let's start off a little bit with the the situation with, with Iran and diplomacy and foreign policy. Now, I just had Daniel McAdams on, so we have gotten the basic contours of what's happening with Iran and with the the proposed nuclear deal with the talks going on. But I want to get the Scott Horton take on that. I mean, do you think that there's any prospect of, of peace here? Do you think the neocons are swarming? Do you think the terms are reasonable? What's the Scott Horton take on what's going on there? Man, you know what, Tom? I really want badly to believe at this point that it's about 60-40 in favor of a real nuclear deal. And that is, I say that because... The Iranians have been offering the same deal all along, which is, come on, we'll do whatever you want. Let's just get along. I mean, they've said that in 03. They said that in 05. They said that in 09 and 010. And uh, now they're saying it again. They've been very flexible on this. And what's changed is that their new president is a guy who is not, you know, so easy to demonize like Ahmadinejad with his big mouth and his horrible crass slogans that he says all the time and all that. This new guy, Rouhani, geez, people like him. I guess, you know, the State Department weenies and stuff. He's educated in the West, and so is his whole team. And they're looking at this as their chance. And now the breaking news on this, uh, the most important piece of news on this, is um, by our friend Phil Giraldi in the American Conservative magazine from, I think, just yesterday at AmericanConservative.com. And it's Intel Community Makes Peace. And this is about how they had these secret negotiations going on in Oman under uh, William Burns, at the same time that they had the above-board negotiations under uh, Lady Ashton and uh, Secretary Kerry. And what was going on in Oman was William Burns and and his Iranian counterparts, they were really working out this Iranian deal, Um, you know, the long and the short of it, in advance, in deep background. And they brought the CIA with them. And the CIA worked with the Iranian intelligence agents, and they ran through uh, every scenario, and I mean, these are CIA analysts, they ran through every scenario. If you had this many centrifuges, and they spun at this speed for this long, you could have this much uranium enriched to this much purity, and we would be happy if you only had this and not that and whatever. And they ran through it all and worked it all out together already. And so the interim deal and then the you know upcoming final deal hopefully are really just the surface and the deal has virtually already been made and the deal being the extra super duper absolute verification of the peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear program it's already a safeguarded nuclear program 
And as the former IAEA director, Mohammed El Barad, I put it, there's not a shred of evidence. There's no indication that they've ever diverted any uranium to any military or uh, weapons purpose of any kind whatsoever. And all this deal would do, basically, is the Americans and the West lift our sanctions in exchange for them limiting the amount of enrichment that they're doing, stopping enriching up to 20%, which is for their medical isotope reactor, and they have plenty that they've already made anyway. Uh, that's 20% uh, pure uranium-235. And uh, limit it only to 3.6% and limit the amount being produced and et cetera like that. And anyway, so there's no good reason in the world why not to do the deal. There's every good reason in the world why to do it. The the uh, Israel lobby just had a complete go at it at 100 miles an hour, did everything they could in the House and the Senate, and Obama faced them down. Obama went to the Democrats and I guess to the Republicans, too, and said, do not pass these sanctions. And they were gathering almost veto-proof uh, majorities of co-sponsors. And um, Obama went and told them, do not mess this up right now. And they backed down, at least for now. Um, Hillary Man Levert pointed out today that the APAC meeting, their big meeting in D.C., is still coming up. So it's not over yet for them. But uh, that's a, uh, basically the interim deal and, the, um, and the, the postponing, at least, of the new sanctions in the Congress are two real big victories for Obama on this. And this is the only good thing he's ever done, by the way. It's the only thing that I could applaud him for whatsoever. I guess he signed that thing reducing the disparity in the mandatory minimum sentences a little. <laughs> but other than that, this is the only thing I support him on whatsoever, and it really is a good thing. It really could be the first step toward ending the Cold War with Iran. Now, that being said, there are a lot of professional Iran haters in America whose jobs and, you know, whose lives are at stake here and will do anything to keep the Cold War going. And that includes people in the State Department whose job it is to work things out. So, uh, you know, it's, it's far from a done deal. And even if we get the nuclear deal, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll have a normalization of relations. But it's the single big fake outstanding issue is their nuclear program. And if that's resolved, then I think it very well could be a major turn in American foreign policy over there. All right. Let me jump in here because of an item that was up the other day linked on the Drudge Report. And you click on it, it takes you to WorldNet Daily. So <laughs> I don't know. But it, they're talking to a former deputy director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, who is saying, and th this is a paraphrase, that if Iran breaks its deal with the West tomorrow, the country would be only two to three weeks away from producing enough highly enriched uranium to assemble a nuclear weapon. What do you say about that, Scott Horton? No, that's absolutely not true. In fact, uh, that Intel community makes peace. That article by our friend uh, Phil Giraldi, former CIA officer in the American Conservative Magazine, directly takes that on. It says it would take them five years from breakout. Uh, World Net Daily, you know, these are the guys who, if we listen to them, uh, or if what they said was true, Iran would have had nuclear bombs all these years. I mean, what are they talking about? They never have even begun to start making nukes. And if they did, what they would need is to, uh, they would have to convert the uranium metal they've already got back into uranium hexafluoride gas and then run it through their centrifuges again to get it up to 94% pure uranium-235. And then they'd have to get the metallurgists to uh, actually even make a bomb out of it. And then the only kind of bomb they'd probably even be able to make at that point would be a very simple gun-type nuke like the Hiroshima bomb, which they couldn't deliver except, what, in the back of a flatbed truck or something? And then what, they're going to drive it across Iraq and Jordan to Israel or some nonsense? And this whole thing is ridiculous. Even if they did have a couple of nukes, they couldn't do anything with them except hope to try to keep us out with them which is really what they're doing with their peaceful nuclear program, too. They have their electricity program, but they're, having, they're trying to create for themselves a nuclear capability as a pseudo-nuclear deterrent. Instead of going all the way to a nuclear bomb to try to keep us out, they've got it set now so that if we do attack them, then we'll know that they have the capability to go ahead and, I mean, it's not like we can really invade and sack the place and occupy it, so if we bomb them, then that's going to turn their civilian nuclear program 
into a nuclear weapons program, which if the West doesn't want that, they need to back off. And that's the strategy on the Iranian side. But as far as technically speaking, you know, the Likudniks and their sock puppets in the United States have been crying that the Iranians are about to have nuclear weapons any day now since 1984. And they're liars, and they've been lying this whole time. And you know what? If you just go and read Haaretz, the uh, liberal daily out of Tel Aviv, they have all the quotes of the Mossad professionals, not the lying windbag politicians, but the Mossad professionals using the exact same language as the CIA, which is that we judge with high confidence that they are not making nuclear weapons, that they have not made the political decision to begin to make nuclear weapons. That's the truth about Iran's nuclear program right there. All right, Scott, I want you to run down where in the world right now the U.S. is most heavily involved in the war on terror. Where, are, where has the war taken the U.S. as of this moment in 2014? Okay, well, first of all, Afghanistan. We've still got uh, north of 50,000 troops occupying that place, and Obama, of course, is trying to strike a deal with Karzai uh, to keep more troops after that for uh, so-called training and counterterrorism missions. Uh, of course, the entire surge is a failure, and the Farzai government, it's basically just a collection of the communists that America used to back the Mujahideen against back in the 1980s, who were on the eve of absolute defeat when they lost their leader, actually on September 10, 2001, but then America came in and installed the rest of them in power in Kabul. They have no natural power in the country at all. And their government and the CIA put out a new intelligence estimate just the other day trying to scare us into staying. But their point being that uh, if we leave, the government in Kabul cannot stay, cannot be the government of Kabul. It's a Potemkin village, the whole thing, a 12-year war for nothing, tens of thousands dead for nothing. Uh, also next door in Pakistan, the drone war, uh, the covert drone war continues, as well as in uh, Yemen and in Somalia, uh, the New York Times just uh, uh, published a thing last week about how back in October, Obama, uh, and I, I bet you the New York Times probably knew about this all along, too, uh, but covered it up for him. Uh, but back in October, Obama expanded the Special Forces mission in uh, Somalia. The CIA, of course, has been running around there killing people since 2001, destroying everything. Uh, that's a whole other show, I guess. Um, and then... In Libya, the consequence, and, and in Mali, the consequences of our 2011 war there uh, uh, rage on, although uh, the uh, actual number of boots on the ground, that kind of thing, are limited, thank goodness. But that could get much worse. I mean, anytime our establishment wants to turn their attention toward Libya, boy, do they have a bunch of excuses for intervention there. Well, it turns out the country tore itself completely apart after we overthrew the wacky colonel there, and so now we have to, you know, clear, hold, and build, and give them purple-fingered elections, and, and train them up, and then we'll stand down, and all of that. If they want, they could break off uh, that direction into Libya this minute. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's Syria, where America is trying to figure out which al-Qaeda group we want to back the most. Is it the Islamic Front, or is it uh, ISIS, or is it the uh, Jabhat al-Nusra? And as these different al-Qaeda groups fight amongst themselves, others in Washington, D.C. wonder whether maybe now isn't the best time to go ahead and switch back to Bashar al-Assad, who, after all, in the Bush years, was a loyal employee of the CIA, where he did nothing but torture people to death all day for him. So, um, in fact, uh, Michael Hayden, who used to be his supervisor in the torture program, was saying, maybe we should go back to Assad at this point, this whole back in al-Qaeda thing. Uh, is getting a bit out of hand. And you might wonder, why would Obama, Tom, why would Obama back al-Qaeda in Syria against, including al-Qaeda in Iraq, guys, in Syria, against Bashar al-Assad? And the answer is because that's what Israel wants. The answer is because Israel hates Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is backed by the Ba'athist Shiite government in Syria. And they're allies with Iran. And so that's why we hate Iran. Well, that's a big part of why the American state hates Iran, and uh, that's absolutely why the U.S. has been backing a regime change. That's why uh, John Kerry to this day is insisting that any peace deal begin with Assad stepping down and a regime change there, uh, because... Uh, as uh, Michael Oren, the outgoing uh, American uh, Israeli ambassador to the United States, put it, if it's 
Hezbollah versus Al Qaeda, I choose Al Qaeda because Hezbollah is backed by Iran. And that's why America, that's why Obama is committing the highest treason in backing the brothers of the September 11th attackers uh, against Israel's enemy, Hezbollah, which hadn't attacked the United States really ever because even the Beirut attack of 83 of the barracks bombing there, that was the Amal militia, not even Hezbollah then. So Hezbollah, which is not America's enemy, but is Israel's enemy, uh, is, uh, that's the motivation, because they're Israel's enemy. That's the motivation for Obama and the Democrats uh, and the CIA backing al-Qaeda in Syria. Scott, I want to ask you about the drone issue, because a lot of times when the drone subject comes up, people say, Look at the drones are killing innocent people. The response you get, I think even from some ordinary Americans, I expect from the neocons, but I think even from some ordinary Americans, the response is, well, look, of course we're going to occasionally hit a wedding. You know, we're not perfect. You can't hold us up to an impossible standard. What is the point of these drones? Who are they going after? And what do you say to the person who says, look, you know, hey, obviously, you know, you're going to make an omelet, you're going to break some eggs, and brides and grooms are the eggs. Well, you know, I mean, this is the thing. If you're making an omelet that is the American empire, then that's absolutely and completely unjustifiable. If omelet was the legitimate defense of the United States and as accurate as we can possibly be in defending ourselves from the onslaught of the Islamo-Fascist Caliphate, uh, would be occasionally some civilians die, then at least they would have some kind of argument, I would still argue against it and say, you know, killing innocent civilians is killing innocent civilians and it's not okay ever. But, um, you know, they might as well be targeting innocent civilians. A lot of the times they are targeting innocent civilians. The so-called signature strike, it sounds like, oh, they had to get the president's signature. No, that means he drives a truck and he owns a rifle and that's the signature of a bad guy. So kill him and whoever he happens to be with. That's what makes a militant when you're at war for an empire and your enemies are the civilians in their own countries who dare to resist you, then, yeah, that's the profile of a bad guy. A male between the age of 10 and 70 and may or may not be carrying a rifle, right? That's a fighting-aged male. That's a possible enemy. And even in the establishment, it's 2014 now, so come on. Even David Gregory on Meet the Press, Tom, he said to Leon Panetta back when he was the head of the CIA, uh, you know, a year ago, um, he says, Leon Panetta, look, we're uh, doing this drone war in Yemen. We keep killing innocent people, and we keep hearing reports in the media from Yemen where people are saying, listen, we never liked al-Qaeda. We never even heard of them, but we hate you now, and we're friends with them now because of what you've done here. And so is this, are we creating more enemies than we had in the first place, and is it worth it? And the best Leon uh, Panetta could answer, and that's David Gregory talking for crying out loud. Talk about three-by-five card of uh, acceptable opinion, you know? <laughs> and and uh, Panetta said, hey, look, these are the tools we have, and so we have to keep using them, and so, yeah, we'll keep using them. And that, again, I'm no statist, and, you know, I'm I'm really, you know, not in favor of giving the state permission to do any of what it calls defense anywhere at any time, because uh, I just don't really believe in that. But this would at least be a different argument, Tom, if the truth was that they started it, and the best we can do is try to defend ourselves the very best way we know how, and sometimes it's a little bit messy and there's some unintended consequences. But the truth is that the U.S. started it, not them. And history didn't begin on September 11, 2001. It began on September 11, 1990, back at the end of the Cold War, when George H.W. Bush announced that America is going to invade and occupy the Middle East and stay there in the name of Saddam Hussein's uh, invasion of Kuwait in 1990. And the troops stayed there, and they waged their empire of benevolent global hegemony and blockade against the Iraqis there ever since. And that's what provoked the terrorist war against us, starting back with the first World Trade Center bombing, with the Kobar Towers attack in 96, with the embassy attacks and the coal, and finally September 11th. This was the enemy that we had created for ourselves out of our old friends, the Mujahideen who worked for Ronald Reagan in Afghanistan in the 80s, turned them against us by invading and occupying their territory. And now 
that doesn't make them the good guys, but it does mean that we started it. And the fact is that Al-Qaeda are such bad guys that they create enmity everywhere they go. The Iraqis let them be their allies for a little while against us while they made themselves useful, but really they just made things worse for the Sunni insurgency by bombing marketplaces and cutting people's hands off and acting crazy. And they ended up, uh, the Sunni tribes turned on al-Qaeda in Iraq. The same thing is happening in Syria right now. These are the worst people in the world. They have no support except for sometimes some people in the Middle East are happy to see them attack us because of all the evil that our government commits against them. And so the truth of the matter is, if America just stops supporting dictatorships and stops supporting revolution and stops supporting containing this government or helping that government torture its citizens to death for daring oppose them or whatever it is, and we would take a Ron Paulian hands-off attitude toward the Middle East, all of the terrorist war against us would dry up. You don't need drone strikes making more and more terrorists every time you kill one or claim to kill one and take out a wedding party and create a hundred more enemies. It doesn't have to be that way. You could really, if it was Ron Paul in office right now or Harry Brown who ran for president as a libertarian back in uh, 96 and 2000, the way that they would have handled the whole thing. I mean, I know Harry Brown told me on my show back in the day, uh, that he would have just given the world his great Statue of Liberty speech and said, we are a light, a beacon of liberty, uh, not a laser designator uh, for high explosives. And he would have hired some bounty hunters to kill bin Laden, Zawahiri, and their, you know, dozen closest friends. And then that would have been the end of that. That it ended the empire and the war on terrorism would have been over by Christmas 2001 and we would be free and prosperous and happy right now. You know, that's... It's it's so anticlimactic after what you just said for me to ask you anything further, but I still feel compelled to do so as long as I have a few more minutes with Scott Horton. And normally, Scott, when I I'd like to have you on repeatedly, we'll pick some topic that's in the news and I want to get your spin on it. But here it's my first chance to talk to Scott Horton with me, the one asking the question. So, yeah, I do want to kind of jump around. I do want to just pick your brain. So I want to jump around to something completely different. I want to ask you, I, I remember Ann Coulter, who likes to take positions just because they're contrarian positions, like just because she likes to annoy people. And so she's basically taking the position that the war in Iraq has actually been a great success, and we should quit apologizing for it. It's been a real success. Now, that would be a whole show. In fact, maybe we should have a whole show on that. But one aspect of it that she thought was successful, and a lot of the neocons on the radio would say successful, was, after all, we had the surge, right? I mean, the surge, everybody admits that when we had the surge, things really did, be, did begin to turn around. And that just showed that what we needed was just a little more oomph in the offensive there. What was the real story of the surge? Can you give us the Reader's Digest version? What was the real story of the surge? Yeah, I mean, look, that whole point of view, as you can tell when you repeat it just now, it's all based on glittering generalities, right? If Ann Coulter had to break down for a moment who is actually who, and whose side was America ever fighting for on that war from this year to that year, her argument would completely fall apart, right? All these people have is a bunch of slogans. The surge is working, the surge is working, and then the surge worked, the surge worked. Well... Let's see, the definition of the surge in the first place was supposed to be to create such a good security situation in Baghdad that all the various factions could come together in the capital city in a democratic fashion and work out their differences peacefully through the rule of law in their wonderful new democratic system. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry, because does anybody think that those benchmarks were met? Does anybody even remember the term benchmark? David Petraeus said, yeah, we got these benchmarks, and then they just went away. And the benchmarks were replaced by the surge worked. Well, what did the surge work at? What the surge worked at was ethnically, or the sectarian cleansing, basically, of almost every last Sunni Arab in Baghdad. That's the majority in Iraq, were, are the Shiite Arabs. They were, um, you know, oppressed by the minority Sunni Baathist dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. And when the Americans came in, they tried to set up a little caucus system of their sock puppets and, and hand-picked chosen people. But then the Ayatollah Sistani in 2004 said, we want one man, one vote, or you're going to have to start this war all over again. 
against the people who stood out of the way while you got rid of Saddam. And so George Bush had to back down, had to give him one man, one vote. So what's democracy really mean, Tom? Majority rule. And what's that mean? That means the Iraqi National Alliance of the Shiite parties, the Dawa Party, the Supreme Islamic Council, and Muqtad al-Sadr. And what they did was they took Baghdad, which was about 50-50, Sunni and Shia Arab, is now approximately an 85 or 90 percent Shiite city, the Shiite United Iraqi Alliance, that was why 4,500 Americans died. That was why somewhere between 500 and a million Iraqis died in that horrible civil war was America was fighting to accomplish the sectarian cleansing of Baghdad and the handing of the capital city over to the Shiites. The first time the Shiites have controlled the Arab capital city in a thousand years. They controlled Cairo for a little while a thousand years ago. And they destabilized every nation in the region. They had to debase America's currency and therefore the currency of every state in the region in order to do it too, which is what helped lead to the Arab Spring. All these people suffering under their American torture dictators. Now they're broke. They came in for bread. They hate their government more than ever before. And that was a big part of what caused the uprising there. And now the, the Mujahideen War of the Sunni-based insurgency that rose up to fight the American invasion, they're losing battle against the Americans and the Shiites, uh, the Americans, the Iranians, and the Shiite Arabs, I should say. Uh, they've now gone on to fight in Libya and in Syria, where America, under Obama, has taken their side. The Sunni-based insurgents from Iraq, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, and Ansar al-Sharia, these guys are veterans of the Iraq War, where they were the Sunni-based insurgency, the al-Qaeda in Iraq guys. They went home to Libya, Obama and McCain fight a war for them. Then they, they send them on to fight the war in Syria, like we talked about before, where America's actually on the side of the al-Qaeda and Iraq guys. So now the news is America's going to go train. We're going back to Iraq while well, they're going to Jordan to train the Iraqi army in fighting al-Qaeda now uh, because they're still the bad guys in Iraq. While we're, while we're backing them, arming them, and the CIA and the Saudis have been backing them and arming them for two and a half years just north of the border in Syria, the border that hardly exists anymore as the jihadists are attempting now to finally create that bogus, ridiculous, Islamo-fascist caliphate that never existed, jihadistan, that never existed in the Middle East. The Ba'athists in, in Iraq and Syria, those are, as, as Lou Rockwell put it, those are the last countries in the Middle East where you could get a drink until America's wars and revolutions over there. So what has Ann Coulter's war done? It's given the south of Iraq to the Iranians, and increase their power and influence in the region more than anything anyone could have ever done for them, including if the Prophet Muhammad came down from the sky with, you know, magic wishes. He could have never given them the south of Iraq the way America's given it to him. And then it spread the Saudi-style bin Ladenite jihad across North Africa and the Levant. So... Yeah, right. Ann Coulter, the surge worked. As long as nobody asks what the surge work means. Look, Scott, I, w- we got to have you on regularly because I just I love talking to you. I, I, I learn so much listening to you. I enjoy listening to you. And I hope people will listen to your program. Your program comes on right after mine at LibertyExpressRadio.com. So you start at 3 p.m. Eastern right after me, and you go for two hours? That's right, from 3 to 5 Eastern, every day at the Liberty Express. And then also you've got your own site, scotthorton.org, where I hope people will go and uh, help you out. I mean, you are sacrificially dedicating yourself to this cause every single day, educating people about the issues of the day in Scott Horton fashion, that in a way that only Scott Horton can do. I'm so glad you found some time to be with us today, and, and I hope this will be a regular thing. Me too. Thank you very much, Tom, for having me. I appreciate it. All right, everybody, that was Scott Horton. I hope you'll tune in to his program, The Scott Horton Show, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern at LibertyExpressRadio.com and check him out over at ScottHorton.org. Later this week, it's economist Bob Murphy taking your questions and economist Walter Williams taking your questions. Submit those questions by following me on social media, on Twitter, at Thomas E. Woods, and on Facebook, facebook.com slash Thomas E. Woods. Just do hashtag Ask Murphy and hashtag Ask Walter on Twitter. On Facebook, I'll have threads dedicated to both of those shows saying, hey, what do you want me to ask Bob? And 
What do you want me to ask Walter Williams? So make sure you are over there. And thanks again, everybody, for helping us keep the lights on here by making your Amazon purchases through the Amazon widget at TomWoodsRadio.com. All right, more propaganda busting tomorrow. See you then. The Tom Woods Show.